Hello, everyone. This is Shane Lynn and MacArthur Museum of Arkansas Military History, uh, back with our interview series. Today, I'm privileged and honored to have Governor Jim Guy Tucker, our 43rd governor of Arkansas. Uh, he also served as Attorney General of Arkansas. He was the second uh, district congressional representative, U.S. representative, as well as Lieutenant Governor before becoming governor. But what we're going to talk to him today about is the Vietnam War. For those who have not been to the museum, you've not been to our Vietnam gallery, and if you have, then you will notice the photographs of, of Governor Tucker and Bruce Weston as part of our exhibit. It's called uh, Two Guys from Hall, uh, referring to them uh, going to Hall High School and graduating there in 1961. But first, Governor, thank you and welcome. Thank you very much. Happy to be with you. Uh, you know, we we mentioned about uh, you and Bruce going to high school together at Hall High School, 1961. You graduated. What was Little Rock like back in 1961? What was it like being a senior in high school? And and I assume you and Bruce were good friends then. Yes, we we, we became good friends in high school. Uh, the, uh, the there were not as many schools in the city. Uh, Hall High School was not opened until about two years, three years before we graduated. The first year it was supposed to be open. It was closed down due to the uh, efforts to integrate Central High School. Hall got caught up in that. So I got sent off uh, my wife uh, or my mother after a few weeks of uh, two a day football practices said I couldn't be a semi pro high school football player. <laughs> So I, I went off to Tampa, Florida and went to high school there and then and went off to Harvard to, to undergraduate school. But Little Rock, uh, we were not many years out of when we had a, a, a trolley that ran down Cavanaugh and all the way to downtown. And uh, we'd go up to the trolley turnaround in West Little Rock, very close by. Uh, all the kids rode their bikes everywhere. And uh, it, it was a, a very pleasant place to grow up. Uh, at that time, but races were totally separated and uh, trying to bring them together was a real chore. And it was, you know, one of the um, uh, anomalies of the Vietnam War is blacks and whites were right together, right next to each other all the time and looking out for each other and hiding uh, in a foxhole with each other and shooting out of trees with each other. Uh, so. Uh, for me, while I had had many relationships among the black population uh, and college, the, the impact of, of being with each other uh, in those circumstances uh, made a real difference. Uh, I did not see skin color at all after that experience. Right, and talk about after you graduated, you went to uh, Harvard, uh, college and tell us a little bit about what you did there and then you were a, a, a United States Marine Corps reservist. I, I joined the United States Marine Corps Reserve in the uh, spring of my freshman year as I recall uh, and it was called the Platoon Leaders Corps uh, and it was taught for uh, uh, prospective officers uh, who had the rank of lieutenant uh, to start with and they would be in command of a platoon of up to 40 people. Uh, and so the, the day after, two days after I graduated from Harvard, I went on active duty at Quantico in the uh, spring uh, or the summer of 1964. Right, and um, actually you were in some of the top phases, you were uh, top in your training class, weren't you? Yes, I was. I have a, uh, uh, I had a disease that I didn't know the name of it, but it bothered me in college. Uh, it's called an autoimmune disease where your immune system attacks itself. Uh, and it was damaging some organs in my body. Uh, and uh, they, they discharged me, honorable discharge for that. I appealed the discharge. And I actually was successful in the appeal. I was helped by Sid McMath and his father, General McMath, 
uh, who were both Marines. Uh, I did some training with Sid, uh, Sandy McMath, who's a lawyer here in Little Rock. But uh, I ultimately won a reversal of that and uh, was uh, able to go both back on active duty. But by that time, I'd been to Vietnam twice, 65 and 67, uh, as well as uh, time in Lebanon in 66. And I uh, chose not to, to go back on active duty. Right. Well, um, when the when they uh, when you were discharged before your appeal, you did go to Vietnam though as a civilian war correspondent. What what led to that? Well, uh, part of it was I had trained for that, and uh, I was young and immortal, <laughs> and uh, I uh, I wanted to go go do it, and so uh, I. I got on a ship out of uh, San Francisco called the Beaver State. Uh, I had a job on it called Wiper. Uh, as the name implies, that's what I was doing all the time is wiping stuff up all over the ship. And uh, we, we went through, uh, through Japan and saw the horrible consequences of the uh, bombings that took place there. And it still looked like the totally bombed out cities. Went on to Busan, Korea, which was the site of one of the major uh, and turning points of the war when the North Koreans came down and tried to push us out of the country at Pusan. Uh, and there was a perimeter around it that was successfully defended and the Marines and other forces shoved them back north of the demilitary or the uh, borderline there. Then went on down to uh, Hong Kong and into uh, uh, Thailand, Bangkok, Thailand. Uh, the, uh, in the course of that, I visited with a newspaper man down there who uh, told me I should call uh, the editor of the Saigon Post. So I did that. And uh, after winding my way through Cambodia and, and uh, some other spots, I went on to, uh, to uh, the capital city there in uh, Vietnam and uh, Saigon and went to work for the Saigon Post, an English language daily in Saigon. And that was where I started going all over the country, uh, really from literally from end to end of the country uh, and spending time with U.S. forces and writing articles about what was happening in Vietnam for the huge population of uh, uh, American and other military personnel there in Saigon. What was your first impression once you got there to Vietnam? Well, the city was overrun with American forces. So that was a strong impression. There was a huge press corps there at the time. Uh, you could go across the street from, from the hotel I was in at the time uh, to what was called the Continental Hotel. And they, here were all these people from ABC and NBC and uh, newspapers from all over the world sitting out there on the porch having a, a glass of wine. And at the same time, here were these soldiers moving around the city. Uh, it was quite a, uh, a different way to, to see things. On the other hand, all of those personnel, the press personnel that were there, were also going out into the field of it every day. And there were terrific photographers. Some were freelance, like a, uh, a young man named Tim Page. Uh, and Tim and I became friends. And I was with him the first time he was wounded there in Vietnam. He was wounded several more times. I actually thought he had died and found out later, uh, the several years later, that he had in fact survived. But multiple uh, journalists and photographers in particular uh, were killed uh, during their efforts to cover the combat. There were men and there were women both. And they came from all over the world. Uh, to photograph and to report on what was happening in this fight between the United States of America and North Vietnam, Vietnam. and and uh, and really China was much involved as well. Well, you as I mentioned before, we have several of your photographs on display here at the museum. Um, did you have an interest in photography, or how did I mean they're really well done? Uh, how did it, or did you just happen to become a natural uh, uh, I actually went to write. And uh, as I went through various parts of the 
of, of Southeast Asia at that time. And when I was on the ship going over, I wrote some poetry and wrote some uh, little, little uh, articles. Or I just wrote about it. So when I got to Vietnam, I thought I would only write, but I was writing about uh, things that were happening. You know, I was covering that uh, for uh, ABC uh, as well as for the Saigon Post. And uh, I, I had never simply taken photographs. Uh, cameras were relatively new and the cameras they had over there were amazing. Uh, the great cameras that were coming out of Japan in particular. So I started uh, taking a camera with me and taking pictures of things. And uh, I was seeing the war from a very close perspective. And many of the photographers were, uh, were wounded or killed over there because they were so close to the combat, uh, sometimes just trying to get a better angle on something and they exposed themselves, or sometimes just from the fact that they were with troops moving into very hazardous areas. Uh, I was very fortunate. To, uh, I feel like they tried to shoot me a lot of times, but uh, it seemed to come awfully close. And uh, there were, of course, explosives that were not aimed at individuals but at groups of people so it was a it, it, it was a learning experience this was not a john wayne movie uh, this was the real thing and uh, as a boy i'd watched a lot of john wayne movies that typically and, and similar ones that typically glorified war uh, the there was nothing glorious about what was happening uh, in this or any other war zone you see a you see a, a stack of young men, uh, for example, up at the DMZ, uh, who were all killed in a battle and, and literally stretched down the side of a, a, a long foxhole trench. And uh, we did not take pictures of that. Uh, a family back home seeing a son or a brother or something uh, dead without any warning would have been horrible. And we simply did not do it. I did not even take pictures of the body bags uh, for, for military that had been killed or anyone that had been killed for the same reason, really. There's no reason for a newspaper, in my view, or anyone else to be showing pictures of the body bags and the bodies there. By the same token, as I said, this was not a John Wayne movie. Uh, folks shouldn't be covering it in a way that hid what was happening to either the American or, or British or Australian troops that were there, but it shouldn't be hidden from the, uh, uh, the, the Vietnamese casualties. Enemy and friendly shouldn't be had, hid either. War is generally about killing people and destroying things for one side to get the advantage over another. And that was the reality of what we were seeing. And these were young people, overwhelmingly young people who were killed. Well, and um, this really wasn't your first experience with war, or say your family, in the sense that your father was a veteran. Um, yes, uh, my father was born in 1892. Uh, he was a, uh, his, his father was sheriff of Union County and had his left arm or right arm blown off in an ambush, uh, uh, was shot about 11 times on the town square and they had to call out the Arkansas National Guard by the governor to, to uh, quiet what was almost a mob down there. But my father uh, joined the Arkansas National Guard and was called up of all things to chase Pancho Villa uh, mm -hmm. along the Mexican border. He said they rode all day, got off, ate lunch, got on, rode again, never saw Pancho Villa. They came back and he was mustered out of the guard and immediately called back up uh, to go to World War I. Uh, so he participated in World War I, uh, was, was gassed. Uh, they used gassing uh, heavily in that war and uh, was wounded uh, in the leg, uh, not severe, but uh, wounded there. Uh, and so I, I went all the back, way back to his experience. He never talked about 
uh, the First World War, except one time. I was driving him to work when I was a teenager and learning to drive. And he, worked, he was manager of the Social Security Administration in Arkansas. And he was leaning back in the car seat next to me and he said, you know, I remember one time we were going through such and such a village and uh, the, uh, it was dark past sundown and suddenly we started getting shelled. Uh, I directed the men into a large house next to us and we took shelter, but a large explosive hit the, the, that house and the floor collapsed and we were in total black darkness, could see nothing. We we're feeling our way around the wall to figure out how to get out of the cellar when it was discovered that it was not any cellar, it was a wine cellar. So it, he said it took him till noon the next day to get out. <laughs> yeah, you know. that's, a, that's an interesting, great story. But he, he went on across, and, and of course, uh, as a result of that, I knew about the American Legion when I was a boy and spent a lot of time always visited him at the Legion Club when I was old enough to look vaguely legitimate being there. Right. Well, you know, speaking of your writing skills and you that you had intended to go over to write, in addition to your photographs, you did write. In fact, when you got back, you published a book called Arkansas Men at War. And uh, it, it's, a, it's an interesting book. I've had a chance to read it. Um, it, I like it because it tells the perspectives and you followed Arkansans uh, during the war from all over the state. And why, why did you write that book? Uh, it was uh, the forward, the introduction is by uh, Senator Fulbright, wrote the introduction to it. But why was, why did you write the book and, and all these years later, what do you take from it? Well, I occasionally look back at the pictures because I, I knew so many of the uh, people that I, that I got to know so many of the people that I interviewed. Uh, John Butt, who was a sniper there, uh, and I have a picture of him in the book, uh, uh, died a number of years ago uh, while he was living in Fayetteville. But I would go up and visit with John some. I wrote the book really for the purpose expressed to, to talk about Arkansas men killing the war zone, the war was going on. Uh, the, the, uh, my goal was to find them, find the people from Arkansas, and I simply made requests to the various uh, uh, branches of the service. So I was with Navy uh, ship uh, with a gentleman from West Memphis uh, who took us up. We, we, I said it was on the DMZ, but we were really across, uh, we were in North Korea or North Vietnamese territory. Um, we had people from every single corner of the state, uh, you name it, and there were Arkansans there. I did not meet any Arkansas women there, but I didn't have access to any list that would show male or female. They were all assumed to be U.S. soldiers. And I wrote about them in the book, and uh, the goal was to uh, sell the book in Arkansas, uh, let Arkansas people will see what was going on in the war. And that's what Senator Fulbright wrote about in his introduction. And that was the purpose of it. I, I wrote it as I was about to enter my first year in law school or my last year in law school. I graduated from law school in 1968. The book was published as I recall in 67 uh, and uh, began practicing law. And then in 1970, I got elected prosecuting attorney for Central Arkansas, and that was my first political office. And it, it, uh, it was such a change from what I'd been doing uh, between war and between law school, where the object is to avoid uh, conflicts where instruments of war or the behavior of war are repeated. When you interviewed these soldiers from Arkansas, what was your impression of them and maybe their impressions of the war as well? Well, particularly on my 67, or 67 when I went back to Vietnam for my second trip there, the, uh, it was clear that they were seeing the same things that soldiers from all over the country were seeing. And that is that this was a, an unending conflict. 
and in the absence of just total destruction of human life and, and people, uh, it, it was not something that could be won uh, as such. The, the seeing soldiers sitting on the edge of a sandbag and just having a smoke of marijuana, which was quite frequently seen among the troops, the depression that I saw among those soldiers and Marines and Naval personnel was phenomenal. And yet the strength and courage they showed and, and being willing to go back out and risk their lives, either fighting or providing support for those who were fighting every single day all over the country uh, was, was really a very depressing experience. At the same time, it was an amazing human experience to see the courage and determination that they showed in, in facing adversity and overcoming it on a regular basis. Did When you arrived there, um, and then over the course of your uh, tours there, did your opinion change? Did you have maybe an opinion when you got there or some views, and then after a few tours that changed? Yes, when I originally planned to go to uh, the Marine Corps. I assumed we were going to Cuba because the Cuba conflict was ripe. And I studied Spanish. Uh, when I got to Quantico, Virginia, I, I thought it didn't look much like uh, Cuba. <laughs> I clearly trained for Vietnam and it became clear uh, in, in that summer of 64 that that's where I was headed. Uh, so I, it was the the lead up to the war and the training we received was uh, you know to encourage the soldiers and be sure they understood that the why we were fighting as best they could and get them ready to go but by the same token the training tried to tell you that this was not a uh, an experience that would be a, a pleasure this this was what war is and they demonstrated that very clearly. Uh, so when you're practicing firing a wife, rifle or using a pugil stick uh, in lieu of a bayonet to learn how to use a bayonet, this was not a friendly boxing match or, or shooting ducks. This was killing people. So as I experienced the reality of war on both occasions, I certainly went from a not a fan, but a, a willing supporter of the war to seeing that this, I thought it was a terrible mistake. And I think it turned out to be. Right. Well, you know, you, you put yourself in harm's way, uh, as you mentioned before. In fact, uh, you carried a weapon with you, uh, even as a civilian correspondent. And, and uh, fortunately for us, uh, the museum a few years ago, we were gracious enough to donate that here and let us display the actual M2 rifle that you carried uh, while you were over there. Yes, the, the AR-15 or the M14 uh, weapons were more common uh, among our soldiers at the time, uh, but I was able to acquire an M2 folding stock automatic carbon. Uh, and because I was with sometimes a very small groups of men moving uh, in my mind, especially having come from my Marine training and still being gung ho. Uh, I, I did not want to go into the field without a weapon. So I carried that. Uh, in 65, I also carried a, uh, a recorder, a radio recorder and uh, recorded interviews with boys uh, or men that were there and they were run on Arkansas radio stations. Well, and we appreciate um, your donation of your photographs and letting us tell your story and, and the rifle as well, because it, it helps paint a picture of the Vietnam War, especially for Arkansans. Um, as we wrap things up, is there any thoughts, reflections you'd like to share with us regarding that time? I think I've shared most of my views of, uh, of war and its risk. I'll tell you one more story, though. Uh, I was in Hong Kong living uh, after, uh, 
after I left the governor's office. And my wife one day said, where do you want to go for our anniversary? And she said, Saigon. And I, I mean, uh, uh, Hanoi, uh, uh, the capital of North Vietnam, uh, Vietnam. And I was astounded. I didn't want to go back to Vietnam, but I did. And while I was there, I ran into both uh, members of the press who I'd served with in Vietnam and also an American uh, officer, member of the army who had lost the use of his legs in a, in a battle zone I'd been in at the time. And he was back in Hanoi for the purpose of lobbying for Vietnamese with Disabilities Act, which he had done in the United States. He was back in the country where he had, uh, against whom he had fought to help those against whom he had fought to have access to public facilities, just as we have done in the United States. The Vietnamese government had done nothing for them. So that, I'll leave you with those words. Okay. okay. Thank you, Governor. And uh, we appreciate you and uh, have a great day. Thank you very much.